Scott, uh, who will be giving our presentation this evening. Um, Dr. Scott has been, since 1987, the Executive Director of the National Center for Science uh, Education, and she is, that's a nonprofit organization that um, orients itself particularly toward the uh, evolution creation uh, controversy. She's got a PhD in biological anthropology from the University of Missouri, and uh, she's taught at the university level. She is um, quite active in all kinds of issues. One of her specialties is uh, the separation of church and state, and particularly with respect to education. She's the chair of the Ethics Committee of the American Philosophical Association, and just recently she's the incoming president of the American Association of Physical Anthropologists. Um, she's a nationally recognized proponent of the separation of church and state, as I told you. She served on many uh, panels and councils, such as the National Advisory Council of American, uh, Americans for Religious Liberty, and she served on the executive committee for the uh, National Coalition for Public Education and Religious Liberty. That's PERL, P-E-A-R-L. Um, she's appeared on a lot of shows, The Donahue, Crossfire, Firing Line, Ancient Mysteries, CNN, Morning Program, Pat Buchanan Show, and many others. Um, and she's uh, a widely sought after speaker, and it's my privilege to introduce her here. Um, she'll be speaking tonight under a faculty development grant uh, on the topic of science, religion, and evolution um, 75 years after the Scopes trial. Or something like that. There's a cheat sheet behind you, you can tell. So let's give her a hand. Thank you. I'm, I'm pleased to share my microphone with Dr. Stanley. Uh, actually, I have to make a, a small correction. Uh, the American Philosophical Society is a quite fine organization, but I, I really am not uh, an officer of there. I was at uh, one point, uh, not a few years ago, the ethics chair of the American Anthropological Association. Well, we do have this problem with creation and evolution in the United States, and we seem to dichotomize these two views. By the way, can you all hear me okay? Is the microphone set all right? How about if I talk a little more loudly? Okay, don't go away. We're going to make a slight change here. I'm going to fix the microphone a little bit. How is that? Is that a little bit better? Can I, more? My goodness. Okay. This is it, gang. This is as loud as the microphone gets. I'll have to just bellow louder at you if this, this is not working. Well, I want to talk a little bit about, um, first of all, in, to introduce my topic, I want to talk a little bit about what Americans think about evolution. And unfortunately, they don't think too highly of it. There have been a number of polls, some better than others, and actually the Gallup organization has uh, produced some polls that are really quite interesting, and I think they ask the questions well. The Gallup organization periodically, every few years or so, asks three questions having to do with creation and evolution. One of them is the young earth creationist question, God created man pretty much in his present form at one time within the last 10,000 years. Um, this is the essence of something called young earth creationism, the idea of special creation of people and animals and plants and everything and the whole universe, um, and a relatively recent um, time period, uh, 10,000 or so years. The second question Gallup asks, man or human beings have developed over millions of years from less advanced forms of life, but God guided this process, including man's creation. This is a theistic evolution question, the, the sort of mainline Catholic and Protestant view that evolution took place, it was part of God's plan. The third question is, man developed over millions of years from less advanced forms of life, God had no part in this process. This is the materialist or naturalist or atheist position. And as I say, Gallup asks these three questions at regular intervals. The response of adult Americans to these three questions has been very consistent over time. From 1982 to 1999, the young earth creationist question is agreed to by mid to high 40% of Americans. The theistic evolution question is agreed to by a very solid, um, you know, mid 30s to 40% of Americans. And quite consistently, the atheist position is agreed to by only about 10% of Americans. And Actually, in June, uh, uh, Gallup asked some additional questions having to do with creation and evolution and the teaching of evolution. Uh, the organization asks, should evolution be a required subject? Should creationism be a, re uh, or should 
should evolution be an elective subject? And of course, uh, there was not a great groundswell of support in the Gallup poll for uh, requiring the teaching of evolution. Um, there was not a very s large uh, uh, percentage of Americans that were crazy about having creationism taught as a required subject either. Notice that's only 25%. But rather more enthusiasm for teaching creationism as an elective. There was more enthusiasm for banning evolution from the curriculum than banning creationism. So clearly Americans are not too crazy about uh, evolution and there's a lot of support. Um, about 25 to 30 percent strong support for teaching creationism in the public schools. And by the way, these data hold for both blacks and whites. Uh, when you combine Gallup, Gallup poll data over 91 through 97, um, uh, blacks actually, uh, uh, African Americans are, are more conservative than are whites, but still you don't get very much enthusiasm for evolution. Now these public data differ considerably from the same questions, the same Gallup poll questions asked of scientists. When the young earth creationist uh, question is of the general public, about 44% say yes, only 5% of scientists say yes. And I'm surprised it's that high, to tell you the truth. Um, let's drop down to the bottom of that uh, chart there. The the, the naturalist, uh, or shall we say atheist question, only 10% of Americans agree evolution occurred and God had nothing to do with it, but 46% of scientists. But I think it's very important to consider the middle line in this, uh, in this table. The, um, the theistic evolution position, which you will see, is agreed to by 40% of scientists and 40% of the general public. So the idea that evolution is something that um, uh, only atheists support or that all scientists are atheists is certainly incorrect. The National Science Foundation also uh, polls adult Americans on their attitudes about science and there is a, a creationism and evolution question tucked in, into the NSF questions as well. They ask the question a little bit differently from Gallup and actually I think a little bit better. They ask human beings as we know them today developed from earlier species of animals, true or false? And again, fairly consistently, rather less than half of Americans accept evolution. The NSF also asks some questions about knowledge of evolution, and these are also disappointing to those of us in the science or education field. They ask, humans and dinosaurs lived at the same time, true or false? <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, less than half, or approximately half of Americans think or are not sure whether the Flintstones is a documentary. <laughs> <laughs> now these data are fairly specific to North America when the same NSF question, human beings evolved from earlier species of animals, is asked of Canadians and uh, members of adult Americans in the United Kingdom and Japan and Germany and so forth. Um, Americans and Canadians are uh, dead ringers for each other, no big surprise, this is North America. Um, but Members, uh, adult Ameri adults of other developed countries, uh, Great Britain, Japan, Germany, uh, etc., um, have a very high percentage of acceptance of evolution. So there's something going on here. Clearly, we have had a lot of controversy about evolution. And actually, although my polls that I'm citing here tend to be stressing biological evolution, especially human evolution, other aspects of evolution come in for a drubbing as well. In uh, Marshall County, Kentucky a few years ago, the fourth grade uh, science book was recalled by the superintendent who proceeded then to glue together the pages on evolution because they talked about the Big Bang without mentioning the Bible. And this of course generated some um, uh, good editorial cartoons such as Adolescent Rebellion in, in <laughs> Marshall County. <laughs> We should only hope that the students are sitting in the back of the garage reading their science books, but nonetheless. And of course, everybody knows about Kansas. Uh, the state of Kansas um, uh, pulled evolution out of the uh, See, now, Aren't you sorry you didn't sit close to watch the slides? The teachers always tell you to sit down in front, and there's a good reason. The caption is, however, kids, the awful truth is we are descended from the Kansas school board. Um, Nonetheless, there's a lot of confusion about evolution. And I thought I would take a little bit of time tonight to talk about what scientists mean when they talk about evolution. Because frankly, if you walk down the street and ask the first five or six people you hear, you, you run into, uh, what does evolution mean? You'll hear 
evolution means man evolved from monkeys. And the other major reply that you will get is evolution means you can't believe in God. And both of these are inaccurate. We should talk a little bit about the definition of evolution. The broadest definition of evolution is that evolution refers to change through time. And lots of things change through time. Stars, galaxies, the planet, living things, culture, human cultures, a lot of things evolve. Biological evolution is a special subset of this general idea of change through time. In biological evolution, we're talking about the idea that living things shared common ancestors and have descended with modification from these common ancestors. In order to understand how biologists look at evolution, you have to start with a population. A population is a group of organisms. It can be a group of plants, a group of animals, um, a group of sexually reproducing uh, organisms, such as college students. Um, anyway, <laughs> but, but one thing to remember is that we're not talking about individuals when we're talking about <coughs> evolution. Individuals don't evolve. <coughs> they are born, they live, they die, that's it. Populations change through time, although individuals don't. There was a Kansas farmer who was interviewed in a uh, um, news report who said that he didn't believe in evolution because he'd been a farmer all his life and he's never seen a chicken turn into a pig, and he was absolutely right. Well, we are talking about populations. Populations of chickens and populations of pigs can change through time. Within a population, let's say we're talking about rabbits, Within a po or moose, we're in Montana, we'll talk about moose. A population of moose will vary. There's gonna be genetically based variation within that population. Some moose are gonna be taller, some shorter, some heavier. Some have thicker coats, some have darker coats, uh, some have uh, longer noses. There's a lot of ways that there will be variation among, a popu among the members of a population of moose. That variation is produced by a number of factors that are primarily genetic, but also there's some environmental factors that uh, influence the, the morphological variation of a, of a popu within a population. And actually, the, these genetic factors are reasonably well understood. We obviously have lots more to learn, and we are learning more all the time. But things like genetic recombination, uh, mutation, non-random mating, and so forth and so on, all contribute to the variation that we find within a population. But populations also don't exist in vacuums. They exist in environments. This is environment taken in the broadest possible way. Not just the physical environment of heat and temperature and humidity and altitude and so forth and so on, but also the um, environment produced by other species that live in the same geographical area. The pre predators, the prey, how difficult it is to find a mate, um, where are the good nesting sites and so forth and so on. So because populations exist in, an, in environments, there are factors that act upon the variation within a population. Now the most important factor is something called natural selection, which of course was Charles Darwin's major contribution to um, biological sciences. And natural selection is the idea that some of that genetic variation within the population is more useful to the organisms having it than other variations. And so the individuals which have those variations will tend to live longer and have more offspring. Those genes, those variations will increase through time. And natural selection is sort of the, the, the most important factor affecting the change of a population through time. So what happens when this process does go on through time? This is all the fancier the graphics get, by the way, at the National Center for Science Education, but hang in there. What happens? We get change through time. What happens as populations change through time? Well, sometimes these populations change enough so that after a long enough period of time, it seems like you've got something different at the end than what you began with. That's one kind of evolution. What is more probable, uh, a probably more common kind of evolution is when you have the change taking place through time and you have some sort of a separation of portions of the species from others, a geographic separation, and because of different pressures acting upon uh, populations that are no longer in genetic contact and just the fact that variations will accumulate through time, Eventually, through time, these two groups, the parent group and the split-off group, change enough that you would say, yeah, we got something different here. We have a species, we have a new species, speciation has taken place. This process of 
natural selection on population variation and repeated speciation produces this hierarchical branching that we see reflected in something like the Linnaean taxonomy of you know, kingdom phylum class. Um, kingdom phylum class. <laughs> Thank you. Order, <laughs> family, genus, and species. Many, many years ago, I learned a very politically incorrect way of remembering that, which is, kindly Prince Charlie ordered five girls stripped. And of course, we can't talk about that anymore, but I still remember it better that way than any other way, but that's because I'm an old lady and I'm not very politically correct anymore. Um, what I'd like to stress is that evolution is a statement about what happened. Evolution is a reflection of history. When we're talking about biological evolution, we're really talking about the genealogical history of a group through time. And the history of a, of a group may, is most likely involves branching and splitting, the extinction of some groups, but the lineage continues lurching through time. Many lineages completely wipe out. We don't have an awful lot of, uh, of, um, of dinosaurs anymore, for one thing. Um, we don't have a lot of uh, Australopithecines anymore. But some lineages evolve into something new and we end up with the present diversity of species that we have today. One of the points that I will be making in more detail a little bit later on is that indeed evolution is a statement about what happened, not a statement about who done it. Okay? There's a difference. What about creationism? Well, creationism is about who done it. The broadest definition of creationism is that, in fact, the universe was created by a supernatural power. This could be God. This could be gods in uh, polytheistic religions. This could be powerful spirits, ancestors, whatever. Among the Navajo, the hero twins are the creators of most, of most living things and the creators of human beings. The Greeks had the titans, uh, the sort of ancestral gods, as it were, as the major creators. Odin created for the Norse. And for Christian Jews and Muslims, the creator God is Jehovah. <clears throat> I'm going to make a suggestion to you that if someone says, I'm a creationist, you really don't know what that person has in his head. Because the word creationism has so many different definitions and so many different understandings, it is almost unusable. But one thing that we do know, one thing that I know in dealing with this controversy for so many years, is that people have a dichotomous view of creation and evolution. They look at creation and evolution as two separate categories, as independent ideas. You've got to be on one side of this line or the other. You've got to choose. I would like to suggest that this I, warring castles idea about evolution and creationism is actually very misleading and actually can be empirically refuted. And of course, in science, we're very big on empirical refutation. So let me talk to you not about the scientific, not about the, excuse me, creation-evolution dichotomy, but about the creation-evolution continuum. And let's walk through this continuum because I think you'll see, I think you'll find it interesting that there are so very many different kinds of people who call themselves creationists, and their views really do vary quite a bit. You, will, you maybe will find yourself within this group. You will probably find yourself someplace on this continuum, so watch closely. Probably very few of you are at the beginning of this continuum, which is the Flat Earthers. Really, there is an international Flat Earth Society. It's run by a very pleasant man named Charles K. Johnson, who lives in Lancaster, California, over there on the Nevada border. If you've ever been in Lancaster, you may have some idea why he thinks the Earth is flat. <laughs> but actually, that's not the case. Mr. Johnson believes that the Earth is flat because when he reads the Bible, he reads passages in the Bible as indicating that the Earth is flat. And if the Bible says the Earth is flat, then the Earth is flat. This is a minority view within Christianity. He's only got a couple hundred members of his whole international society, an uncomfortable number of which are physicians, but I'm not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole. You can <laughs> Next along the line are geocentrists. Geocentrists are those who believe that the Earth is the center of the solar system. And the sun goes around the Earth, the sun and the planets go around the Earth rather than heliocentrism, which is the planets and the Earth going around the sun. There actually is a geocentrist component of the modern-day creationist movement, although it is a very small component, but it is there. Basically, flat earthers and geocentrists have this very old view of the Bible, which parallels that of the ancient Hebrews, um, in which, I guess that's kind of a dim slide, I apologize, the flat earth is in the bottom, 
and this is so nice not being tethered to a microphone here. I, I carry them around with me. The flat earth is in the middle here, and you see these, these pillars of heaven or the firmament, which is basically like a big um, metal dome that supports the waters above the firmament, um, which is where the waters, the 40 days and 40 nights of Noah's flood came through the, the windows of heaven, which are holes in this, this big dome firmament that supports these waters. But notice that in the Bible, the sun, uh, the sun, the moon, and the stars are all underneath the firmament, which means that this is a geocentric picture of the universe. The earth is the center of the universe. And of course, 4,000 years ago, the early uh, Hebrews, uh, who were simple people in terms of their understanding of science, really did uh, believe that the earth was the center of the universe because, of course, the earth was the most important part of the universe because it had been made by God for man. Obviously, geocentrism and, and, um, and uh, uh, flat earthism are, are not major parts of Christian theology or Jewish theology today. These are clearly fringe movements, but I present them on the continuum just so that we have a complete version here. Much more numerous are young earth creationists, those who believe in special creation, which is the theological view that God created everything all at one time. And specifically, when it comes to biological uh, creation, God created the living things in the present day kinds. So he created um, um, liverworts as liverworts, and he created uh, giraffes as giraffes, and he created monkeys as monkeys, and chimps as chimps, and humans as humans, uh, and all the other, and pine trees as pine trees, moose as moose. Uh, he created all the living things in their present kinds. This is the doctrine of special creationism. The focus here is on not just that God created, because all, crea all Christians and Jews believe that God created. The question is how God created and the way God created was as described in the literal interpretation of Genesis. This is the theology of special creationism. I've always kind of liked this cartoon as a special creationist cartoon. The angel is saying, sorry, he's changed his mind again. Stripes on the zebra, spots on the giraffe, no stars on the lion, make the elephant bigger and the amoeba smaller. The idea of special creation is that God created the kinds in their present form, looking as they did because it pleased him um, to do so, and that is perfectly fine. Uh, Gary Larson has a slightly snottier view of uh, special creation, but <laughs> it's, it's the same basic idea that, that God, it's God creates the snakes. Um, it's the basic idea that God creates creatures in their present form. Now, special creationism, or excuse me, young earth creationism and special creationism are associated with a view called creation science, which, by the way, also argues that the earth is only 10,000 years old or so. Scientific creationism is an attempt to argue that a literal interpretation of Genesis can be supported with scientific data. Now, there are plenty of special creationists who don't try to support their point of view with science. The special creationists who do try to support their view through science are known as creation scientists or scientific creationism, and there's a number of organizations that promote this point of view, particularly that of the Institute for Creation Research, about which I'll speak a little bit more later. In this book written by Henry Morris, who is really the father of, of creation science, the um, creation science is described as follows. The purpose of scientific creationism, that's the book you just saw, is to treat all of the more pertinent aspects of the subject of origins and to do this solely on a scientific basis with no references to the Bible or to religious doctrine. However, if, if you actually look at this book, you find that um, although this statement sounds very noble, it isn't quite that way. Uh, within this book, you find the following passage. The origin of civilization would be located somewhere in the Middle East, near the site of Mount Ararat where historical tradition indicates the survivors of the antediluvian population emerged from the great cataclysm. That's spelled F-L-O-O-D, by the way. Or near Babylon, where tradition indicates the confusion of languages took place. Well, hold it, guys, come on. These are not, this is not reliance purely upon science. Clearly, creation science is, is playing, uh, is shuffling the pea uh, under another uh, shell here. The science of creation science is fun to look at if you're a scientist and fun. It's not a lot of fun if you're a high school teacher, mind you, but um, it, they, they make some uh, statements that are really quite, quite strange, such as human and dinosaur footprints being found together in various places around the world. This is a 
man track. This is a, a claimed by creation scientists to be a human footprint, which is found adjacent to some dinosaur prints. I will leave it up to you whether this looks very much like a human footprint to you. As a, a, um, an anthropologist, I am not terribly convinced. The basic position of young earth creationism, quite honestly, is that evolution is evil. There is a lot of, of fear, and it's based on a particular kind of theology, that if evolution is true, then there's no God. If there is no God, then clearly there can be no salvation. Uh, there is no life after death. And furthermore, if there's no God, we'll have no reason to treat each other well. We'll have no reason to behave properly to one another as we should. And we are therefore headed for social ruin. Society will fall apart. Henry Morris is the major architect of creation science. He's a hydraulic engineer who um, founded the Institute for Creation Research uh, many, many years ago. He's currently in retirement. But he has, he has written an enormous number of books and pamphlets and articles on creation science, and he's held in very, very high regard by the supporters of this movement. He has written, evolution is at the foundation of communism, fascism, Freudianism, social Darwinism, behaviorism, Kinseyism, materialism, atheism, and in the religious world, modernism and neo-orthodoxy. Ministers usually giggle enormously when we get to the neo-orthodoxy part, but Jesus said a good tree cannot bring forth corrupt fruit. In view of the bitter fruit yielded by the evolutionary system over the past hundred years, a closer look at the nature of the tree itself is well warranted today. In the creation science literature, you find a lot of references to evolution as a tree of evil. This is a particularly Baroque example that I like a lot. This is from the um, 1994 Creation Science, or Bible Science Association conference held in Minneapolis, St. Paul. But take a look at this. Uh, you can see on these branches of this withered, miserable looking tree, a lot of social evils. You've got racism, paganism, sexual perversion, euthanasia, communism, Nazism, radical feminist movement. You have terrible <laughs> things. <laughs> Abortion. And the source of all of these evils in society is, guess what? Evolution. If you can only get rid of evolution, say these folks, all of these evils will have no support. We'll all be good to each other and we won't be radical feminists or Nazis or anything else. <laughs> um, creation science movement, which is what's happening here, you see the X, this is going to take care of evolution for us, in which case we will all be much better off. We're moving along down the continuum. We have old earth creationism. Now, old earth creationism is for the most part, a special creationism, but it's much more theologically liberal than is young earth creationism, and it's much more scientifically liberal. Um, young earth creationists are quite varied in their theology, but they all accept the idea that the earth is old. Uh, there's no problem with the earth being millions or billions of years old. One kind of old earth creationism is day-age creationism, an idea that came about in actually the 1800s, was quite popular in the 1900s, but is not terribly popular these days. This is the idea that the six days of creation as described in Genesis are really very, very long periods of time. So that's a way of incorporating an understanding of modern science with a still fairly conservative Christian theology. Most day-agers believe that God did create specially, but he created at, at different times, pretty much as it shows in the Bible. Gap creationism is another uh, kind of old earthism, which was very popular in the um, early 1900s, <coughs> excuse me, early 19th century, early 1800s, excuse me. Gap creationism deals with the notion that you can account for the very, very long age of the earth as geology tells us is the case by interpolating a gap between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. There was a pre-Adamic creation. The pre-Adamites were a whole world that was created before Adam. There was this big, big, long period of time, and then God got around to the seven-day Adam and Eve creation. And so gap creationism is another way of accommodating a pretty conservative Christian view to at least some of modern science, at least radiometric dating, geology, physics, and chemistry. Progressive creationism is yet more theologically liberal. One minister described progressive creationism, he was for it, as creationism on the installment plan, 
where God, where, where the geological column is real. It starts out with single-celled organisms, moves to simple multi-celled organisms. Uh, you get a whole bunch of variation at the Cambrian, all the invertebrate uh, uh, general body plans get formed. Later on, you get um, the, the vertebrates, you get um, fish and reptiles and birds and mammals and all of that. But God just created consecutively through time. That's what progressive creationism is. Continuous creationism takes the idea of God creating through time, but God steps back a little bit further from the actual created event. In progressive creationism, you pretty much have God deciding we're going to have trilobites here, and then at the end of the, of the um, Cambrian, we're going to have a different kind of trilobite, and he creates them differently. You don't really have evolution going on. In continuous creationism, you have God bringing about this sequence of organisms through time by directly acting on the, the DNA or the, the laws of natural selection and so forth to, to more carefully sculpt or shape the uh, modern uh, day uh, variation that we see. So you see as we're moving along through these old earth creationists, you're more and more of modern science is being accepted. And simultaneously, the theology is getting a little bit more liberal. I have intelligent design theory as an old earth creationism but it's not really. Intelligent design theory is, is a very recent kind of creationism, and the problem is they don't really tell you what they believe, which is a big, a big issue here. Um, there are some young earthers among the intelligent designers, but most of them are old earthers, and uh, if we have time, we can talk about that later. Further down along the continuum, we have something called theistic evolution. If you went to a Catholic school, dollars to donuts, you were taught evolution because Catholic theology is theistic evolution. Catholic theology looks at the modern variation of plants and animals and all the different um, species and so forth as a result of God working through the process of evolution. Mainline Protestants and Catholics accept this, and most Jews except for the ultra-Orthodox accept theistic evolution as the way God did things. Obviously, here we are accepting all of modern science, but still retaining a religious belief. Um, there's a lot of ways of looking at theistic evolution, and clearly there's a lot of variation among uh, Christian denominations as to exactly how um, God uh, created all these forms through the process of natural selection um, and other evolutionary mechanisms. I, I seem to be running across a lot of theistic evolution cartoons. I'm sure the cartoonists don't know that they're dealing with a specific theological issue, but. I'm tired of making decisions, let's just go with natural selection, is a classic theistic evolution cartoon. A little bit more subtle is uh, this one. Instead of starting from scratch, why don't we just use modified chimp DNA? <laughs> 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 and, and, and I confess I've been a little bit, I've been a little heavy on the biological sciences tonight, and I, I really don't want to leave the physicist out, so you made it all out of quarks, get out of here. <laughs> I mean, basically what we're dealing with with these, um, these traditions is one in which obviously revelation and faith are important, but also one in which the evidence of nature is, is equally important. Um, the Dalai Lama, Lama uh, a couple of months ago was asked uh, what, what would happen if some aspect of science uh, contradicted or, or greatly um, um, disagreed with some precept of Buddhism. And he said, well, we'd obviously change the theology. Um, this is not always the case in, in all Christian denominations, mind you, but I, I was told, I, I did a workshop once for a group of ministers uh, who wanted to know about evolution, and one of them told me about a Marquis that um, was not his church, although he greatly admired it and had remembered it, and he was going to try to use it the following year. Um, this was a, a marquee inviting people to come to church, and um, it read, he came to take away your sins, not your brains, which I think is a good attitude to, 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 to take on this matter. Now we get to the bottom of the continuum, and at the bottom of the continuum we have materialists. Now. Here we are dealing not so much with a religious view as with a philosophical view. And it's worthwhile taking a little bit of time to explain what materialism is as a philosophy because it's very easy to confuse materialism as a philosophy 
with an aspect of science which is also referred to as materialism or sometimes naturalism. Let's pull back for just a moment and think about what science is and what its goals are and what scientists do. People are sometimes surprised when I suggest that they ought to teach evolution, excuse me, they ought to teach science as a limited way of knowing. Science is limited to explaining the natural world and it's limited to using natural processes. This is something, that this, this reliance or rule that we have that we can only explain the natural world using natural processes is something called methodological materialism or methodological naturalism. Now, this is a rule by which we do science. And the reason why we say we can only use natural explanations is not because all scientists are atheists. We could tell that from the Gallup polls. That's not true. The reason we say only natural explanations need apply are two. One, because it works. And it works really well, and we are going to just keep mus mucking about trying to find natural explanations. The second reason is because Actually, there are three. The second reason is that if we allow ourselves to say, geez, this is a tough problem. I'm really having a difficulty discovering a natural explanation for the origin of life or whatever problem du jour you're working on. This is really tough. God did it. Then you stop looking for a natural explanation. And you know something? If you stop looking for a natural explanation, you will never find one. There may not be one, but if you stop looking, you'll never find one. So we just force ourselves to keep looking for natural explanations. The third reason why we don't allow God did it to be a scientific explanation, why we limit ourselves to natural explanations, is because one of the most important aspects of science is testing our explanations against the, general, against the natural world. We test our explanations. An experiment is one kind of test, but I don't like to use the word experiment because when you use the, exper the word experiment, people think you're pouring you know, things from one beaker to another. There's a whole lot more to scientific research design than just the experimental design. So, but what an experiment is is a test, and that's the big idea of science. You're testing your explanations, getting rid of the ones that don't work, hanging on to the ones that do work until they can be proved wrong too. And you gradually move toward a more accurate understanding of how the world works through this process of testing. Well, what do we have to do when we test an explanation? One of the things we have to do is hold certain variables constant. Um, and you can do this through experimental control. You can do this in an observational experiment. Sometimes you do it statistically. Like I say, there's a lot of different research designs. It's a fun topic. Get into it. But one of the important aspects of, science, of understanding something scientifically is to hold constant some variables. Okay, now think about what this means if you're going to argue that you should be able to use God did it as a scientific explanation. If there is an omnipotent power in the universe, you cannot possibly hold his effects constant. You can't put God in a test tube. You can't keep him out of one either. So because it is impossible by definition to control for the effects of a deity, you cannot test explanations based upon supernatural intervention. A friend of mine once said, <coughs> yes, we will, we, will, we will allow explanations involving supernatural intervention as soon as we have invented the theometer. <laughs> but since we do not have a theometer, we have to simply restrict ourselves to methodological materialism. We will explain the natural world through natural cause. Now, that doesn't mean there's no supernatural cause. It just means that it's not part of science's job description. And you can believe that God did it. You can believe that God did all kinds of stuff, and that's fine. That's your privilege. But you can't say, you can't say that wearing your scientist hat. Similarly, you can't say God didn't do it and claim that you are making a scientific statement for the same reason that you can't say God did do it. It's outside of our, our line of, of possibility. Now, so that's why we use methodological materialism. That's why we restrict ourselves to explaining through natural cause. There's also another kind of materialism, which is the one that I was showing you on the continuum. This is philosophical materialism. This is a perspective, a philosophical view, that there is no God. There is no God, there's no gods, there's no demons, there's no fairies, there's no supernatural at all. The only thing in the universe is matter, energy, and their interaction, which, which is why it's called materialism. It deals with matter. Um, 
philosophical and methodological materialism are not the same. This is a major confusion in the mind of the general public, and it is a confusion that is exploited by anti-evolutionists who want the public to believe that scientists are atheists, that scientists are saying God didn't do it, that scientists are denying any kind of supernatural. No, we're not denying it. We're just not using it as part of our explanation if you're going to call your explanation scientific. Okay, so if you recall the continuum, we had quite a, quite a wide variety of people who call themselves creationists. There are different kinds of creationists. Um, it, it is simply not the case that there is a dichotomy between creation and evolution. Um, one segment of this continuum has vigorously objected to the presentation of evolution for more than 75 years, which was the date of the Scopes trial in 1925. A brief history of, of anti-evolutionism will show, anti-evolutionism in America, will show three time periods. The first being the period of banning evolution, which is the time of the preceding the Scopes trial. Between the period of, excuse me, of, um, I guess that, that's not a real slide. <laughs> Surprise me. Um, between 1919 and 1927, a number of states had anti-evolution laws introduced into them. Their legislatures had discussed, and actually three states passed laws banning the teaching of evolution. Um, the reason for this is that the scientific and educational community had accepted evolution. And evolution was appearing in science textbooks. And in fact, uh, by the turn of the century, the first couple of decades of the century, um, evolution was presented quite regularly in high school textbooks. But it didn't matter a whole lot because not very many students were going to high school. Between 1990 and 1920, however, there was an enormous burst of growth in the attendance of, uh, of, of American students going to secondary stu school. Um, this has to do with economic factors and various factors and legal factors as well, mandatory education and the rest. Whereas in the old agricultural days, kids would drop out of school at eighth grade, now they were going to high school. So when so many more kids were being exposed to this damnable doctrine of evolution, the religious conservatives in the United States uh, raised protests against its teaching and attempted to pass laws prohibiting the teaching of evolution. To understand why these laws were struck down, you need to understand something about the First Amendment. First Amendment has three clauses. One's on religion, one's on free speech, and one's on freedom of assembly. The religion clause says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The establishment and free exercise clauses balance each other out in a sense. They mean you can't promote religion and you can't inhibit it. You can neither advocate nor prevent the practice of religion in public institutions. So what this means is that public institutions, like the public schools, have to be religiously neutral. What the courts decided um, regarding these anti-evolution bills passed in the, during the Scopes era was that they were not religiously neutral. That, in fact, they promoted religion and, as the judge wrote in uh, the Epperson versus Arkansas decision, striking down Scopes tri type anti evolution laws, at the bottom, the state has no legitimate interest in protecting any or all religions from views distasteful to them. This brings us to the second period of history, uh, the creation science period. Um, Epperson versus Arkansas was uh, uh, written in 1968. And creation science really got rolling shortly thereafter. In the mid-1970s to mid-1980s, there were efforts to pass equal time for creation and evolution legislation in legislatures all over the country. Uh, we counted something like um, over 30 uh, uh, bills that were presented in state legislatures. Um, two states passed them, Louisiana and Arkansas. Both uh, went to trial, both were challenged. And laws requiring that if you teach evolution, you have to teach creation science were struck down in 1987 by Edwards versus Aguilard um, based upon First Amendment uh, Establishment Clause grounds. Edwards wrote, or the judge in Edwards wrote, the act impermissibly endorses religion by advancing the religious belief that a supernatural being created humankind. In other words, it promoted religion, therefore it was um, uh, unconstitutional according to the First Amendment. 
This brings us to the period of time that we are in currently, which I and some others have called neo-creationism. This is sort of post-creation science. Now, I'm sure the proponents of creation science would not be happy to hear that they're the button shoes of the anti-evolution movement, but unfortunately, they are. Uh, they have been passed by, shall we say. Creation science has been declared unconstitutional, so it's not going to be taught in the public schools. But Justice Brennan, who wrote the Edwards decision, striking down equal time laws, left a couple of loopholes that uh, the neo-creationists have seized upon. Brennan wrote that teaching a variety of scientific theories about humankind to school children might be validly done with a clear secular intent of enhancing the effectiveness of science instruction. He said that if you have, um, uh, the, the teachers possess a flexibility to supplant the present science curriculum with the presentation of theories besides evolution about the origin of life, and teachers are free to teach any and all facets of this subject, all scientific theories about the origins of humankind. Well, that's true. Teachers have a right to teach all scientific theories. There's only one. It's called evolution. Okay. But what this has done is create a cottage industry of anti-evolutionists to generate alternative scientific theories. Now, of course, creation science was the original alternative scientific theory, but that was struck down because creation science is obviously creationism. It's a religious view, so forget it. But what's happened is that they are now assiduously avoiding the C word. Uh, they're avoiding the use of the word creation, creationist, creationism, anything having to do with creation. And instead, we're hearing things like abrupt appearance theory, which, <laughs> which has to be my all-time favorite. I just think that as euphemisms go, by golly, that's a winner. Uh, and intelligent design theory, which is, a, as I say, a neo-creationist view. These are argued as being, as being scientific alternatives to evolution. Now, within the Edwards versus Aguilar decision, there also was appended a dissent that was uh, written by Justice Scalia. Justice Scalia also opened up another s uh, avenue, or, or at least provided a suggestion to the neo-creationists for how they could continue to fight against uh, evolution in the schools. Scalia wrote, the people of Louisiana, including those who are Christian fundamentalists, are quite entitled as a secular matter to have whatever scientific evidence there may, may be against evolution presented in the schools, just as Scopes could teach the evidence for it. This has created a new cottage industry of evidence against evolution. Now, what happens in the old creation science days is laws were passed and advocates would re recommend that we teach, we teach uh, evolution and then we teach creation science to balance it out. Now what we're hearing is, well, we're going to teach <coughs> evolution and we're going to teach the evidence against evolution to balance it out. Ask me, ask any of the scientists at this university, what is the evidence against evolution that high school teachers are supposed to teach? And we will look at you with a very blank look because we don't know of any evidence against evolution. We do not know of any evidence that disproves the very good inference that living things shared common ancestors. Now, we fight like cats and dogs about what actually happened and whether this group is directly related to that group and what this phylogeny is and that. That's fine. We argue about the details. We argue a lot about the mechanisms. How important is natural selection? Are there other factors? What about genomic reorganization and these other cool things coming out of developmental biology? We argue about that stuff. We don't argue about whether evolution takes place. That is a non-argument, a non-issue. So there isn't any evidence against evolution as understood as, as descent with modification or common ancestry. But I'm seeing this popping up in school districts around the country. In um, Prior Lake, Minnesota, there is a requirement that, te that teachers have students list and explain some of the data and scientific reasoning that tends to cast doubt on the evolutionary theory. When you ask the proponents of these evidence against evolution arguments, what exactly should the kids, should the teachers teach, they give you a list that's identical to what they used to call creation science, which is why I think it's very fair to say that teach evolution and evidence against evolution is nothing but a, but a, um, a smokescreen for teaching evolution and creation science. In uh, Moon Area, Pennsylvania, they have a regulation where this, the students are directed to analyze and summarize evidences to provide validation or invalidate theory of evolution by natural descent. <laughs> this was written by the science faculty, not the English faculty, remember, so. <laughs> Notice the, 
the last two examples that I gave you keep talking about theory of evolution, theory of evolution, very compulsively talking about the theory of evolution, the theory of evolution. Well, there is another enthusiasm of the neo-creationists, which is to argue that evolution is just a theory, it's not a good fact. And everybody knows facts are really important. But think about what a theory is in science. Cell theory. Do we argue about whether living things are composed of cells? No, but that's known as cell theory, okay? Atomic theory, do we argue about whether um, matter is composed of atoms and smaller elements? No, we don't argue about that. We argue about the details, but we don't argue about atomic theory. Clearly, scientists are thinking about the word theory very different from the way the general public thinks about theory. The way scientists look at theory is a theory is an explanation. A theory is the most important thing you can do in science. A theory is this logical construct of facts and laws and hypotheses and tested ideas and stuff that works, and you put it all together logically in a framework and it's an explanation. It's the coolest thing you can do in science. It's not exactly the way the general public looks at the word theory. So what you end up with are these regulations around that say, you know, evolution is a theory, not a fact. Um, I'm glad to say that a 1996 law that was proposed in Tennessee was not passed. But here's what it read. If it would have passed, teachers in Tennessee were told, no teacher or administrator in a local education agency shall teach the theory of evolution except as a scientific theory, by which we mean hunch, of course. Any teacher or administrator teaching such theory as fact commits insubordination and shall be dismissed or suspended. Now, how enthusiastic would Tennessee teachers be to teach evolution? Not very. I mean, this is a, th these kinds of things crop up periodically, and they're extraordinarily intimidating to teachers. Understandably so. The idea of disclaiming evolution in the fas fashion of evolution is just a theory by which we mean hunch rather than explanation, or in some way belittling it or presenting it as somehow qualitatively different from all other science, is very popular. The, State of Alabama has a disclaimer. Um, sorry, we missed a page here. I don't know what happened to it, but it went away. Um, the, Alab the state of Alabama has a disclaimer pasted into the front page of all of its biology books. And it begins, this, dis this textbook discusses evolution, a controversial theory some scientists present, oh, 99%, as a scientific explanation for the origin of living things such as plants, animals, and humans. I'm not going to go through the whole Alabama disclaimer. If you're curious about this, go to the NCSC webpage. We have an analysis of the Alabama disclaimer line by line and why this is really crummy science and is ridiculous to put into a textbook to confuse students with. But I will do one more paragraph, one more sentence from the Alabama disclaimer because it so well illustrates a major, major misunderstanding of how science works. No one was present when life first appeared on Earth. Therefore, any statement about life's origin should be considered as theory, not fact. Okay? Now, this just illustrates so many things that people misunderstand about evolution. And believe it or not, the people responsible for education in Alabama, the members of the Alabama State Board of Education are the ones who impose this upon the teachers and the students. The people who should be most knowledgeable don't know zip about science. The fact that you cannot directly observe something does not make it impossible to study scientifically. Science teachers, be sure your students understand that. You don't have to directly observe something in order to study it scientifically. And you know, look at, look at these two sentences here. There's, there's something that people are missing uh, and being inconsistent about, which I think is fairly obvious if one thinks about it. Um, it's the same disclaimer. <laughs> um, the state of um, Oklahoma also uh, uh, toyed with uh, uh, using the Alabama disclaimer. Uh, fortunately, at this stage, they are not. Well, what do we do? Scientists say we should be teaching evolution in the schools. A number of years ago, a very famous geneticist wrote an article in the American Biology Teacher. The title of the article was, Nothing in Biology Makes Sense Except in the Light of Evolution. 
And obviously that's a little hyperbole. I'm sure I could find something in biology that would make sense without evolution. But the important thing was not the title of the article, but what he said within the article. He wrote, seen in the light of evolution, biology is perhaps intellectually the most satisfying and inspiring science. Without that light of evolution, it becomes a pile of sundry facts, some of them interesting or curious, but making no meaningful picture as a whole. And this is the great strength of evolution for biology and also geology. Geology doesn't make sense unless those plates move around and, and the, the surface of the earth has evolved as well. But in biology, you've got all these facts about organisms, which are really cool and all that, but why is it that all living things get their energy through ATP? It's because they are all descended from an organism very, very early that developed that particular way of making energy move around the cell. Why is it that all living things are based upon DNA, RNA? It's because they're descended from an organism that <coughs> did that. Why is it that all vertebrates have this um, a four limb structure where we have one bone here, two bones here, a bunch of little bones here, and a bunch of radial bones there? It's because all vertebrates are descended from a common ancestor. The idea that, that this kind of um, genealogical relationship of species took place is what makes biology hang together and make biology make sense, a meaningful picture as a whole. So scientists say, teach evolution. And you know the best way to, to think about uh, why that is a true statement? You go to this university, and you go to any other good university in this country, including Brigham Young, Notre Dame, Baylor, and Brandeis, and you will be taught evolution matter-of-factly. One of my board members is a fourth-generation Mormon biology professor at Brigham Young. I assure you, the biologists and geologists at Brigham Young teach all those Mormon kids <coughs> that evolution happened. And obviously you're getting it in Notre Dame and Baylor too. Teachers say, teach evolution, okay? The National Association of Bio Biology Teachers has written that indeed, as I've mentioned before, modern biologists study, ponder, and deliberate the patterns, mechanisms, and pace of evolution, but we don't argue about whether evolution took place. The National Science Teachers Association recommends that science curriculum teachers should emphasize evolution in a manner commensurate with its importance as a unifying concept in science. And that's not just biology, that's, that's Dobzhansky writ large. That's a unifying concept in astronomy, in geology, biology, anthropology across the board. School boards say teach both. Well, let's think about this for a minute. Remember what a school board is. A school board is an elected entity. School board members are politicians. Political decision making is different from real decision making. In political decision making, when side A comes up and says, two plus two is four, and side B comes up and says, two plus two is six, the normal political decision making approach is to compromise. <laughs> and this is exactly what is going on when you hear school boards saying, well, let's teach both. We've got people in the community fussing about evolution. Let's just teach both creationism and evolution. When you hear that argument, think back to the continuum both? Where, what's both? You've got evolution, there's only one scientific evolution. But you've got so many different kinds of creationism just within Christianity. Just within the Middle Eastern monotheisms as it were. What are you going to do about Native Americans? They've got a whole bunch, they've got about 40 or 50 different creation views. What are you going to do about Sub-Saharan Africans? They've got an awful lot of views about evolution there too, Southeast Asia, uh, Hindus, Buddhists, etc. What do you mean both? Both implies two. There's a whole lot more than two. You're going to turn science class into a comparative religion class? Well, as an anthropologist, I think comparative religion is a really important <coughs> subject, but I don't think it should be talk, taught in science class. I'll get to that in a moment. Indeed, the continuum certainly suggests that both is not a good, good idea. Um, Again, I would remind you about the First Amendment. We also should be religiously neutral in school. Well, what about creation science? Should we teach creation science or intelligent design theory? Should we teach evolution an alternative to evolution, such as been suggested by some of the anti-evolutionists? Well, there's a problem here. Like this cartoon says, um, what, here are the facts. What conclusions can we draw from them? That's the way we tend to do it. 
On the other hand, there's the creation science approach. Um, here's the conclusion, what facts can we find to support it? And I found this cartoon a number of years after a very important legal decision, McLean versus Arkansas, was written. But this cartoonist captured very well what the judge in McLean was writing. The judge said, you cannot properly describe the methodology used as scientific if you start with a conclusion and refuse to change it regardless of the evidence developed during the course of the investigation. Same thing. All right, can we keep everyone happy? Well, one of my character flaws is a chronic pessimism, and I, or chronic optimism, pardon me. <laughs> the water bottle is almost full, which is probably a good thing for me to hit anyway, because I'm losing my voice. I think we may not be able to keep everyone happy, but we can at least keep, keep people from revolting. Um, and although we all know many revolting people, I think we want our classrooms to be uh, calm in areas where people can learn good science. I have a very simple suggestion. We should be teaching evolution in the uh, high schools of our country. Obviously, we teach it at the college level. But we need to teach it with sensitivity, because there is a minority of Americans who feel very strongly about evolution. I suggest that we learn and teach accurately about the nature of science. Um, distinguish science from philosophical naturalism. Don't let the anti-evolutionists get by with equating the process of science with a view that, that God had nothing to do with it or that God doesn't exist. That's philosophical naturalism. What science, science is all about is methodological naturalism. And you need to make that clear to students, because otherwise students and members of the general public will be very confused about and, and will, be, will feel that they're forced back into the dichotomy. We should also learn and teach accurately about the nature of evolution. Um, in addition to evolution not being man-evolved from monkeys, the big idea of evolution is a historical statement. Living things had common ancestors. It's a statement about what happened, not who done it. And if sound bites help, use them. Perfectly fine. And I also suggest that in descriptive fashion, we should let students know about the descriptive, about the diversity of religious approaches to creationism. I personally am way down there at the bottom of that continuum. I am a philosophical materialist myself. I'm a non-believer. But when I teach evolution, I teach it in a strictly religiously neutral fashion. And I don't tell students that evolution means you can't believe in God, because that's ridiculous. That's empirically disproved by all of these evolutionists, all the scientists who do believe in God. The fact that I and some others don't is not evidence that the whole crowd is that way. And that has to be done. And it's very important that students know that there's not one point of view on this as a religious person. Religious people are all over the map. One of the most interesting websites that I occasionally uh, visit and lurk around in, uh, listservs I mean, is a uh, site where uh, evangelical Christians are arguing about evolution. And they're arguing with each other. Because some of these evangelical Christians are evolutionists, they are methodological materialists, and they disagree with other evangelical Christians who are special creationists. And these people are arguing science, and they're arguing theology, and they're going at it hammer and tongs. Clearly, there's a lot of different ways for individuals to accommodate religion and science. I think we should teach about creationism, creationism's plural, but we don't do this in a, in a science class. We do this outside of science, and we do this in a religiously neutral fashion. We are descriptive rather than proscriptive. It is not appropriate for teachers at the high school or college level to say, you know, here's the continuum, but these guys are really the right ones. Um, or to say, here's the continuum, and this is all nonsense, and you should take your faith and stuff it. That's not part of your job. But there will be students in a class, some classes, who come from religious traditions where they are biblically literate. They simply cannot accept that living things were not created in their special kinds. That's fine. Remember that education does not compel belief. Its goal is to encourage understanding. It is important for a student like that to learn evolution. Whether the student accepts evolution is his own business. It's not the job. And Parents have to understand this, because they have the idea that students go into a science class where they're taught evolution, and the teacher is just beating on their heads to force them to believe evolution. 
I tell you, if any of your professors ever says, I believe in evolution, say, Dr. Scott suggests you don't use that phrase, okay? I don't believe in evolution. And I don't think George Stanley does, and I don't think the other scientists here do. I don't think we believe in evolution. I think we accept it as a very good explanation for the diversity of living things. I don't believe in gravitation. If I don't support this, how many think it's going to fly around the room? <laughs> you are right. <laughs> That's not gravitation. That's unsupported things fall. That's an observation. That's a fact. Unsupported things fall. How do we explain that? We explain that through the theory of gravitation, that the mass of that pencil and the mass of the Earth attract each other. That is a theory. That is an inference. That's not an observation. That's a very important theory. Um, Newton was kind of keen on it. Did a lot of good work in the early days, and it's been developed since then. But it's a theory, OK? I don't believe in gravitation. I accept it as a very good explanation. I don't believe in evolution. I accept it as a very good explanation. So if any of you are ever talking about believing in evolution, try to get that out of your vocabulary, because you don't believe in evolution. You believe in God. You don't believe in God. You believe in you know, the Giants will win the World Series or whatever sport they play, but you don't believe in evolution. <laughs> I would hope that at some point, so, so basically a student does not have to believe evolution. A student merely has to understand it. He can accept it or reject it. And those are some of my simple ideas for maybe resolving some of the problems that we have about the teaching of evolution and the creation evolution controversy. I would hope that we would reach a point where this last cartoon, got to end with a cartoon or a sunset, one of the two, um, is not as predominant as it is in this country today. All right, it's summer vacation, we're free, now we can do all the things we couldn't do during the school year. And there they are reading their Darwin in the library. I would welcome you to come to the web page of the National Center for Science Education. I would even welcome you even more to join. I know we have some NCSE members out here in the audience, and I thank you for coming tonight. And I thank all of you for coming to hear me on this uh, rather chilly night. Chilly for us, California, hot house flowers, anyway. And thanks so much for inviting me to come. Well, thank you, Jeannie. I think uh, there's a little bit of time left for this question. If there's any questions out there, please uh, direct them to this man in front. This isn't so much a question as an observation. Uh, at the beginning of your talk, you basically said that almost 50% of the nation, uh, you know, believes strongly in, uh, uh, you know, doesn't doesn't accept evolution. Doesn't accept evolution. And um, <coughs> then then you said later that within the scientific community, it's almost. It's an old battle that doesn't, that is boring and doesn't need to be fought anymore. But the end result of that is that um, you get kids coming through uh, schools who will get, you know, even if they're taught something about evolution, it's, it's often as if it is, you know, it, it, as if it's a fact. And then they get, at some point, they get barraged. Uh, they get hit with a barrage of all the creationist arguments. They get hit with that before they get to school. Well, sure. I mean, you know, they, they, they get all those views before they even get any, any kind of real scientific instruction. But um, nowhere, in your, nowhere in your presentation did you talk about where do we lay out, you know, the good arguments to allow them okay. to... Uh, um, I think I understand your question. ...to fend off some yeah. of this stuff. Um, there, there, there's two components to this. Uh, this fact that uh, such a large number of Americans don't accept evolution. Um, part of it is, is lack of knowledge of the nature of science and the nature of evolution, what evolution really is, as opposed to all the misconceptions that they have. You know, there's all these other misconceptions I didn't talk about, how oh, evolution is progress and all this stuff. But the other thing is people don't really know their own theology. A couple of years ago, the Pope, uh, the current Pope, um, <coughs> issued a statement from the Vatican reiterating, he's like, this is the fourth statement from a pope, his second one, reiterating that evolution is okay with Catholics. And you'd have been surprised at the, 
at the number of letters to the editor that came in and said, I didn't know that, and these were from Catholics. I mean, and an awful lot of people just don't know their own theology. So one of the things that we do at the National Center for Science Education is we try to work with religious professionals to get them to, I mean, you know, seminary trained ministers are rarely biblical literalists. They know too much about how the Bible was put together and they're much more thoughtful about their theology and so forth. And so the tendency is to, uh, you know, think of that as an interesting seminary topic but not really relevant to the people in their parish or the people in their congregations. But they need to deal with this issue and, and help their, the members of their congregations as mainline Protestants and Catholics understand their own particular views on evolution. Now, that's sort of a scientific approach and a religious approach, and obviously one approach alone isn't going to do it. I think that the way to get kids to understand evolution and appreciate its strength as a scientific idea and discover really what a, a neat idea it is and how exciting it is to learn about these things is you start in the elementary ages, <coughs> in the elementary grades, with very simplified concepts that relate to evolution but are not evolution itself. So in, you know, along the third, fourth grade around in there, you can start dealing with um, basic concepts of heredity. Because of course, where that genetic variation comes from is a very important part of, of, of understanding the big picture of evolution. But at those early grade school uh, levels, you can start getting across some ideas about, you know, we look more like our parents than anybody else. And, um, you know, <laughs> I guess in one sense you could say we reproduce after our own kind, but that would be a problem, I guess, in some circles. But yeah, get across some of these basic ideas. By the time you get to junior high, you can get into more elaborate genetics. You can get into dominance and recessiveness and some of the actual principles. By the time you hit high school, you can deal with uh, DNA and the molecular structure of, of heredity and how frame shift mutations and all these other kinds of things. You can get, get the whole picture. Um, also, you need to deal with time, and you can start that out at the elementary school level. There's wonderful exercises that, high, that elementary school teachers use to convert the idea of time into something that's more tangible for students, like maybe space. So you get this big, 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 big long string, and you stretch it across the, uh, the um, playground, and you mark off, you know, when did the first life occur, when did the dinosaurs occur, and, you know, Jimmy, you go stand at Archaeopteryx, and Freddie, you go stand at the first mammal. You know, you get the kids all, the, and it's a really fun thing for the kids to do, they run around. And it's a way of trying to get across the idea of, of there's been a lot, a lot of time. Real young kids can't grasp this. Most of us can't grasp it. Deep, deep time is an incredibly difficult concept. But you work at it so that you get the idea across to kids that, that the world is very old and there's a lot of time for stuff to happen. Now something else that already takes place in the um, pre-college education, pre-high school education, is the concept of adaptation gets introduced to kids. Usually it's uh, in the form of, of a protective coloration or something like that where you, um, you get some newspapers and you have the kids cut out some butterflies out of newspaper and you get a couple other kids cutting out butterflies um, out of black paper and you spread them all over the newspaper and then you have the kids be the birds and they go by and pick up the butterflies and you find, of course, it's peppered moss stuff, right? You find, of course, that uh, the more camouflaged uh, uh, newspaper butterflies are harder to see, but the dark ones, you, et cetera. And, and that would be very, very easy by junior high to take that basic idea and turn it into real natural selection. Have the kids actually count the butterflies and graph them, and you can do all sorts of cool stuff with that. And show, and then you have them reproduce. You take the butterflies, and for every gray butterfly you have, you put two more into the pot. And you know, you can make this into a nice simulation of natural selection and show how the population changes through time. Okay. You got the three pieces. You've got time, you've got heredity, you've got adaptation. What happens when you put all three of these together like in a high school biology class? Populations change through time. Put speciation theory in there and you've got evolution. And you've done it without mentioning the E word. I mean, part of the problem is the word evolution connotes to people you can't believe in God. Um, and what you need to do is you, you give the kids all the background and then you, in the high school, you teach them what evolution really is. It's descent with um, uh, modification. It's common ancestry of living things. They go, oh, well, that's not so bad, you know. I, I have had teachers tell me, I have a, a friend who's a physical anthropologist, teaches at a um, um, junior college in the mountains of South Carolina. Now, there's a hardship post. 
Um, but she was telling me how she had a group of kids in her freshman intro class who had never heard the E word. I mean, trust me, their high school teachers had never mentioned evolution. Um, I heard from um, one professor who went to school in Tennessee, is a guy about my age, that when he was a student, he would open his biology book and pages would be cut out if they dealt with the, the E word. I mean, so in South Carolina, they were not teaching these kids evolution. And um, she, of course, teaching physical anthropology, just matter-of-factly taught evolution because that's what you do in college and mm -hmm. just do it. And after three or four weeks, these kids came up to her and they said, well, of course species change through time. You mean that's evolution? We thought evolution meant you can't believe in God. And this is the big problem. Give the kids the pieces as they're taking their regular science education through time, put it all together in a way that makes sense in high school, and kids will understand that this is not an idea that they have to hate and fear. Boy, that was a long answer. I'll, the next question I'll answer much more quickly. <laughs> I promise. How about here? Um, to achieve a national understanding of evolution, at what level do you think needs to be the, the main driving force to, to get that understanding that teachers, families, school boards, at what, what level do you see that there is one main driving force? Well, I think teachers are the key. Certainly, K-12 teachers are, are where we actually do get most of our science education. But, you know, there's other sources for evolution education, shall we say. Um, uh, museums, zoos, um, informal science education, as it's called, uh, institutions like that can make a substantial contribution. There's some wonderful programs on, on television, some less wonderful than others. There will be an eight-part NOVA program. Um, this is what? September, um, probably in January, February, the early part of next year, a f eight part um, or eight, eight, eight hour program on evolution itself, which should be a very good tool for teachers to use both at the college and high school level. And by the way, it also deals with the creation evolution controversy. Um, so I would place teachers as being the most important for this understanding. But you know, parents can also help their kids. You know, take your kid to the museum, help them understand. Um, basic principles of science, such as evolution. Okay, well, seeing how late it is, uh, let's thank Jeannie for um, her presentation. Some of you want to come up and talk to her individually, she'll hang around a little longer. Thank you very much. You're